Welcome to another Word in Your Ear. Now, David and I were working uh, in the music press uh, at the time of Two Tone, and we can tell you that it was a journalistic gift. Mm. It was a fantastic time. There's so much to write about. The look of it, the, the huge characters, the big events, the dramas, the series of absolutely amazing records. And I was reminded, reading this book, that the main thrust of the story only lasted 18 months. An that's extraordinary the, time. Yes. And I just couldn't believe that. And uh, that's all recorded in this, in this superb and this hectic book, Too Much Too Young, by Daniel Rachel. Daniel, it's lovely to see you. Lovely to see you too. And you, I was struck me that you must have been about, what, 10 when, when Two Tone took off? I mean, how old would you have been when it, when it no, happened? It, it, exactly right. 10 when Gangsters was in the charts and uh, probably 11 when Black and White swept our school play, playground. Because oh, it, 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 it was a young people's thing as, as well as everything else, wasn't it? That was the interesting thing. Well, I think Madness made it young for me because they were the instantly accessible band because they seemed wacky and fun and a lot of the content of the songs was accessible, especially as they progressed. Whereas looking at a band like The Specials, I think I was scared of them because <laughs> <laughs> they looked so hard and the issues that they were talking about, um, street violence, knife crime. Uh, I mean, these things would really hit me in the years to come. And I think that's important in a way because the lyricism of uh, Two Tone across all the bands really, I think became an education. And after jumping around to the records and the thrill and exuberance of, of the records and then seeing them visually in the clothes, I realised that the issues that they talked about had kind of seeped into my consciousness in a way that an education at school wouldn't have done. You know, it was very pertinent to people's everyday lives. That's true because Madness wrote about just just the world around them, didn't they? It, was, it had no particular political slant to it, so that would have been far more comprehensible and identifiable if you were 10. Yeah, Mad Madness always said that they weren't political. I mean, they were political in as much as they were supporting a movement that was about black and white people coming together for the first time on stage, really. I mean, obviously it had happened, hadn't it, in, in America, in more in abundance, particularly bands like Sly and the Family Stone, and, in, and here, the Equals, and then bands that had individual members who were black. But the idea of black and white coming together was a political statement for Rock Against Racism at the end of a night, and then Jerry Dammers would said, we should now, I will form a label and a band that makes the statement inherently within the group and bring people together. But Madness obviously didn't have that. They were the only two-tone band with white members, but in, 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 intrinsic in their name, Madness, a Prince Buster song, the type of style of music they're doing, which is a cross of soul, an Atlantic soul, Motown from the States and then Jamaican and Caribbean influences. They felt it was all there within the music. And But strangely enough, they are the band that attracts a right-wing following, as I'm sure you remember from the gigs that you you both went to. The thing well, about I do. The, think about the gigs generally, though. Gigs in those days, that it's very difficult for people to get their head around nowadays, is... They were all quite dangerous. You know, they were there. Anything could happen at a gig. Oh, God, the but Strangler. They, I remember seeing the Stranglers at the Roundhouse and their security was Hell's Angels, which in itself <laughs> was, uh, was, uh, was wound up the crowd and invited violence, I think. That's, that's how you show that you're a fan of the Stones, bringing the Hell's Angels. Yeah. Well, but also the, the, the important difference is, you, you know, people just turned up and paid on the door in those days. Oh. It was, it, they weren't. Very, they weren't often, you know, pre-booking tickets, you know. Mm. So it was, um, it was susceptible to whoever happened to turn up on that any is particular night. That curiosity that uh, across all the two-turn bands, whether it, whether it's the selector with six black members and one white, the beat mixed or, or and specials mixed, is that these far-right supporters and often neo-Nazis were prepared to pay that two pounds fifty or three pounds just to come and salute Zeke Heil at these artists. And yet what flummoxes most people involved in Two Tone, they would then dance in between. Fathom that one out. Mm -hmm. 
Well, I suppose the other analogy is football at the time, you know, that if you wanted to go to football in the late 70s, you just went to football. You just turned up. You paid yeah. at the turnstile. You went in. Not well, like that's that. something I did do as a very young boy, I'd sneak into Birmingham City's ground. And I've subsequently found out that in the years that I was there, that the National Front would plant uh, supporters at three different points in the cop, which is the standing area that surrounds the goal. And, and, and into the main stand. And if when the National Front started up chants in, in position one, if the Birmingham fans didn't join in with the racist rhetoric, position two would start and then so on to position three with the idea to try and infiltrate Birmingham fans. And, I, and indeed, I remember coming out of the ground at, as I do at school and being offered Bulldog, which was the National Front youth magazine edited by a 16-year-old, you know, so mm -hmm. yeah, absolutely right. I mean, these tensions were in football and across music, so it's no surprise it was part of Tuto. So so you, you had um, Jerry Damerson and the Specials starting up in, in Coventry, and then you had Madness starting up in Camden Town. They didn't know anything about each other at all, did they? Yeah, you say that Madness had was dressing the same way, weren't they, and listening to exactly the same kind of music, but just had no idea that something was going on simultaneously. How come that happened? Quite extraordinary, and the beat in Birmingham doing exactly the same and not knowing about the specials in Coventry. And I th it's that thing that Suggs was going to Berwick Street Market, um, where there was a, 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 an old, a, a, a store you could buy old Blue Beat records, and there was an infatuation across that band. The specials were doing exactly the same on Far Gosford Street in Coventry, and this coincidence of going back to find influences from the Caribbean islands and infuse that with loves of disco and rock into what they were creating. And that meeting point eventually becomes the Hope and Anchor on Upper Street in Islington, where there's this incredible moment where members of Madness see this band, the specials, walk in, dress the same as them. Oh, really? Yeah. They've got gangsters. They know about gangsters and they have gangsters on the jukebox. And, uh, and Sug says he, he loves that, and uh, but also loves as much the flip side, the selector by the selector, which is an instrumental track by a band that doesn't yet exist. It's made by Neil Davis, who forms the selector, and John Bradbury, who's the drummer in the specials. And that will eventually, in a great story, which brings in Pauline Black and other members, become them. But there's, yeah, there's this meeting in there between Suggs and Jerry Dammers, and Jerry's explaining to Suggs about this fanciful idea of a British Motown and that at some point he'll bring in like-minded bands and, you know, it must have sounded crazy and and because and, uh, it had never happened really, had it, that a, a, a band unsigned says, you can only sign us if you agree to giving us a boutique label that we will control and we will have the right to record 10 bands of which you as the main <clears throat> label, whoever you turn out to be, will, will release six of them. And of course, one by one, the labels, including Mick Jagger who, uh, of Rolling Stones Records, says, well, who will the bands be? And, and Jerry Dunn is saying, I have no idea, but they will come on the label. Well, OK, great. Well, we'll do a single, then an album. No, no, no. They can come on the label, do one record with us, and then they're free to go. It's there's no ties, no contract. It's a handshake. And madly enough, Chris will say, we, we'll do it. Can I just read a, a little extract here uh, where you talk about the musical composition of the, of, the, of the specials? It's really interesting. This is Roddy Radiation talking. He says, everyone thought they were in a different band. Okay. He said, Linval thought it was Scar. Brad thought it was Tamla Motown. Neville thought he was you, Roy. Horace thought he was a funky type Little Feet band. I thought I was in The Clash. Jerry thought he was in an avant-garde jazz group. And Terry thought he was in The Cure. That's a fantastic <laughs> description of the composition of the specials. Was that part of the reason you think there was such kind of broad appeal? Because there were so many ways into it. I think so, absolutely. And I think that's very critical in re in, in re-understanding or just understanding in general what two-tone was, that it wasn't a simple replica of Scar, that everything that happens between Scar and 1979, 1980, when Two-Tone bursts into the British consciousness, is that music affects it. So 
you know, the disco bass lines of Horace Panther in the specials and Charlie Anderson in Selector. And the, as Roddy says, he brings in a feel of Johnny Thunders and rock and roll. And Terry Hall is unlike as the singer of the specials or Suggs even or Pauline Black are unlike any Jamaican singer. So these elements, you know, and, and critically punk, of course, if you don't have those elements in the music, you don't have two tone. And so it feels like the natural progression, I would say, of of musical genres. So out of punk new wave, this is the thing that then sweeps the nation um, and, you know, commercially eclipses punk. And I think that's yeah. uh, all those elements are, are critical to why two tone was so, so popular. Mm. Another thing that struck me was the, the, the fact that the specials had uh, Rico in their lineup yeah. and the beat had Saxon. I mean, Rico was at least 25, it was almost 30 years older than anyone else. And I couldn't think of anybody at the time, any other movement where you had multi generational groups like that. I mean, that was a, quite a new thing. Yeah, and, and all those extra years, so you could have the experience of rolling the perfect spliff, I think. Yeah. <laughs> Two-tone bus probably really appreciated that. I mean, Rico, um, it, it, it was, he played on Prince Buster Records and then was on that London scene in the mid to late 70s playing with, whether it's Linton Quasi Johnson or um, uh, the Leighton Buzzards, he was mixing with musicians. So it was really exciting, I think, for Jerry to propose that he joins the specials so, and for him to agree and for for Rankin Roger in the beat Ra Roger is 15 at the beginning of that year 16 by the end of it and on top of the pops and his first encounter with Saxa this old guy who um speaks in a in a in, a, in an almost unfathomable patois is in the back of a van and he just thinks he's the rudest person he's ever met in his life and isn't certain why this granddad figure to, in his eyes is there. But the moment Saxa pulls out his instrument on stage at a, a university gig in Birmingham, he's totally seduced by the tones and ability of this man who, um, who according to uh, Roger, Saxa said that he originally jammed with the Beatles. In, um, you know, when the Beatles would go in the early days, 61, 62, and come, having done a gig in the North West, would come back to Liverpool and go to a club and jam. Saxa always said that he was one of those musicians and remember, remembers them boys. <laughs> <laughs> so how difficult was it to, uh, to track down all these? I mean, there's a lot of people involved in this story, you know, a lot of people involved in Toto. Were people generally happy to talk to you about it? No. <laughs> really? Go why, why not? Because I think, and this is a kind of extraordinary thing, really, is that there's a lot of casualties in two-tone. And I'm never quite certain if it's people who were fragile were attracted to this style of music and these bands, and that's what put them there or it was the experience of being in the bands that had quite an effect on them. And I know that the buzzword with young people is mental health, but really, if you look across uh, Two Tone, it, it's all pervasive. I mean, the, the obvious one is Terry Hall, who spoke about it openly in his life. And, you know, and he was abused as a young boy, which he beautifully recounts in that Fun Boy 3 track. Well, fancy that. And, that obviously affected him on, on top of the experience with the specials. But and at the time of the specials, you know, there was uh, Jerry was struggling and talked about having a breakdown at various points. And, it, and you can see it uh, and in the selector. I mean, that you know, the keyboard player Desmond eventually leaves and doesn't return to music with problems. And there's fighting, literal fighting within the band. Knives are drawn on people within other bands. You know, it's, uh, and so there's a reluctance or a hesitation for some musicians to want to go back and relive certain parts of that experience that they found difficult then and even more difficult now. And, you know, over the, so a lot of persuasion, a lot of um, just being genuinely sensitive to people's health, really, I guess, and you know, even in all the conversations I've had with Jerry over the last couple of years, 
be that meeting him or phone calls, text, you know, an abundance of, of conversations. You know, I sense Jerry is so proud of what the specials achieved musically and, and the, the thrill and rush of the gigs where thousands of people literally seem to want to get onto the stage and, and that did happen. But at the same time, it means he has to revisit the latter part and, you know, the split. And, you know, even in the greatest achievement maybe of the specials is Ghost Town and that song's one of the defining songs of the decade. And, and even in that song, Jerry's talking about the violence within the band and the need for the band to potentially, bands won't play no more, uh, too much fighting. is about the specials as much as it's about the wider social... Culture. Well, the one that struck me was the body snatchers. I mean, I just couldn't oh. get over They lived. It was such yes. a short period of time and they just... Uh, yeah, it really, there's an enormous... Class difference in the, in yeah. the group. I think one of them, I think it was Stella. Stella's dad owned a plane, I think. And yeah. I think they went to her house at one stage and one of them looked around and said, it was just some enormous great farmhouse. It said something like, is there a toilet anywhere near here? Which I thought was very funny because it was so huge. But oh, I mean, okay. that was a massive amount of tension going on there. Wasn't it? And they lived a very, there was a very short lifespan, wasn't it, the, the body snatchers? Yeah, 11 months from first gig to last gig. And they, <laughs> within that, they do two singles for... for on, on two tone and and then fall into becoming the bell stars whilst Rhoda Dacker and 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 um uh, uh the bass player um f- do the boiler with the special aka but within Nikki Summer sorry uh and but within that 11 months you know they do tour do over 250 gigs go from only performing covers to writing all of their own material they tour the specials they tour the selector um but the behind the scenes as you rightly say upper class middle class working class um white black um very very difficult kind of band to find out who they are what they are do they get on with each other how do you be in a band how do you gel how does chemistry work we haven't they haven't barely had They've had literally weeks to try and work that out. So they do it all in front of the public eye, mass attention of media because two-tone is the hottest thing. And they take it out on each other because they're trying to deal with the stress and and everything that's happening. And they're kind of being looked after uh, by Juliette DeV, who's the manager of the selector. She's 21. um, And she's Safe pair of hands. (laughs) And she says... I just wish I could have helped them more, but time oh, didn't sure. allow it. And then you get the you get the offer of Richard Branson saying to the Body Snatchers, "Let's send them. Let I want you to go to Memphis and record where Aretha Franklin records." And it doesn't happen. It's you know, it's an amazing story, don't you think? Because yeah. it, it is also. I mean, it's a story largely about people under under the age of what about twenty four. Yeah, I mean, Mar- Miranda just about- and the Body Snatchers goes on tour and her mum sends a note to Sixth Form College saying Miranda won't be able to sit her mock exams. <laughs> that's that's the thing, you know, they were just, they were thrown straight in because it was a great opportunity, wasn't it? But I suppose, it, in you know, it, there's a great benefit if, you, if you're trying to get noticed in being part of a scene and obviously yeah. Two-Tone was a scene in itself. But but then people want to get away from it, don't they? Talk about that. Well, yeah, I mean, the body snatchers form because Nikki goes to see the specials and wants to be uh, a, a two-tone band on two-tone. The, it's the same reason the selector form is that they walk into their second show in Leeds and Jerry doesn't said to me he didn't know if to be insulted or flattered because he was a selector looking identical to them. John John Shipley, who will form the Swinging Cat and then end up in the Special AKA, has a plan that he will go enter into a, a competition that Trevor Horn is judging in Coventry, get the deal, get recorded by Jerry Dammers, become the next two tone band. It works, but yet the first Specials album is recorded in October 1979. In April 1980, which calculation I think is six months, but. Uh, they do more specials. And if you consider more, spe- if you think of uh, Message to You Really, Too Much Too Young, and then you think of, say, International Jet Set and Stereotype, the leap 
in a yeah. six month period musically is extraordinary. And and then Jerry obviously with that leap in sound starts to think of a new look as any band does. They want to progress, but it's moving so fast. Um, and somehow the specials managed to carry their fans with that change, albeit, I mean, I, I, I don't know how if you two remember your thoughts on it, but it was a, a strange album war specials for critics to kind of face up to really in, in, of the leap in sound. Yeah, I suppose I suppose it was. I'd have it to... was very different, but I think the music press played a big part in that. Actually, that that they were so enthusiastic early on, and almost inevitably were so unenthusiastic a bit later on. Very, very critical. I remember pieces where they they were accusing Two Tone of not paying the artists. Oh, then, yes, I mean that was you know I don't know what right or on what basis that they they what information they had, but I mean it was just very very destructive, wasn't it? I mean that that those accusations happened in February 1980. So you know you consider the the monumental moment for Top of the Pops when the Selector uh, Specials and Madness are all on the same edition. The, the explosive moment into the the ma into mainstream popular culture, and then within just a matter of months, the music press just deciding, okay, we're going for this band. They send out somebody to meet the beat in Birmingham. And the person says at the top of the article, I hate the beat. Why am I having to do this? That's the premise for one of the beat's first big splashes. And then this accusation that they're stealing music. I mean, it, it's so um, harsh and cruel in as much as Jerry Dammers, who writes the, the main thrust of the specials material, has been making every effort to locate the original artist in Jamaica. But as you probably know... It's never easy. No, yeah. because look, his producers took the credit for the songwriting <laughs> for a start. Yeah, well, this is it. Yeah, well, you see, it's where there's a hit, there's a writ, and particularly <laughs> in the Jamaican record business, you know, because if you get a hit, somebody else says, no, I, I actually wrote that. You know? Yeah, but if you look at the credits on specials records and across other bands on two turn you'll see that they 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 credit accordingly and mm -hmm. and generously in fact because uh, uh, as the book progresses those excuse me those songwriting issues definitely become problematic yeah. uh, it happens with um Nelson Mandela there's claims on on Jerry for additional lyrics in that and um and then there's uh there's the talk of a, a, a do nothing by the specials that turns out to be written by a, a band previously that even Jerry, when he, when he started reading drafts of my book said that can't be right and went and checked it and came back and was astonished that he didn't know that a, it had been done by a country band already. <laughs> well, elements of it, not all of it. Yeah. 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 So let's talk about America because, huh. um, you know that it didn't happen in America, did it? No, but 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 Scar became a kind of strand of of, of American kind of post punk music, didn't it? Did that yeah, come yeah. from Two Tone, or did that was that generated in America? How did that happen? No, it directly comes from Two Tone, and it's really interesting because it comes from the the, the kind of diving off point that gets me and kids of my age, which was Dance Craze the 1981 film that compiled footage of all of the two-tone bands into a 90-minute film in, in, in 1981. Now, if you talk to members of the anybody in two-tone who went out to the States in the 90s, virtually musician by musician, band by band, say that seeing Dance Craze was the thing that just sparked everything on top of a performance that the specials do on Saturday Night Live in April 1980, which... Uh, the two tone fan, uh, American Scar fans regard it as the Ed Sullivan Beatles moment. Oh, uh, really? Two -tone. It was so explosive a performance. The specials were in such a foul mood and they just rip into the cameras more than they're ripping into the I think I've seen that. It's still on YouTube, isn't it? Yeah, it's sensational. I think it is amazing. But it's, it's interesting yeah, that. The is so important. Sorry, sorry, Mark. No, I was going to say they just didn't really, none of those groups really made any, any impact. They didn't really sell any records and it was. Presumably, just too complicated to understand for Americans. Would that be, well, would that be that, right? And the marketing behind uh, Two Tone Records played to the comedy of it. Now, that goes yeah. back to an interesting clause in the original contract that Rick Rogers 
uh, specials manager did with Chrysalis, which was that Two-Tone had total control of the image and the, and the music in the UK. Outside of the UK, Europe and North America, Chrysalis had the right to uh, promote a market as they felt fit, which immediately meant that the two-tone man, the... the Walt Jabsko. Walt Jabsko. Yes. Yeah, we loved it. <laughs> yeah, so all that gets diluted by Chrysalis and... and and you get mixed messages and you read the adverts in the States and, the, yeah, like I say, the comedy gets played out. I mean, they do play very, very big gigs, particularly the specials uh, in the States, and a lot of those were supporting the police to in massive yeah, cool. you know, arenas. Uh, it kind of works, but I think it's 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 been a slow burn in America. And, and in a way, it's kind of understandable because it's such a British... The lyricism and the the street anger, the street violence of the lyricism, it makes sense. Although although I think our our house is the biggest hit in the states for madness. Right, right, right. Who controls it all nowadays? Does anybody control <laughs> the catalogue, or is it all still squabbled over by a million different people? Well, oddly enough, the two tone catalogue now is is back in the hands of Chrysalis, albeit I don't think it's the same Chrysalis that was the original. No, it won't be. Before. No, sure. no. So, so in essence, it's it's there, but nothing happens in two tone without it going back via Jerry. Right, right. So he sits. The, he what does he do with himself nowadays? <laughs> uh, well, he he ma- he makes music. Um, he DJs, which he's incredibly proud of. Um, he gets, his, I think, worked up and excited and prepared for a DJ set, as he probably did a gig. He, for that, there was that period in 2000, late 2010, and onwards, he had the spatial AKA. Do you remember that? The, yeah, yeah, uh, yeah. Some, some raw influence stuff. I um, saw them, they were brilliant, but really complicated avant garde jazz, wasn't it? You yeah, know, it's, it's and a Sun Ra really catalog, um, basically. Yeah, yeah and, and, you know, but ultimately, you, you know, when he tried to reform um, the, the, the specials in around 2007, I mean, they all, the original seven all met up. But, you know, in comparison to the selector who were re- releasing new records, the Beats, who as different, as a Dave Wakeland version, Ranking Roger, and they release records. And um, Jerry's, a, a guess, a madness, obviously, Jerry's, I guess, has become more like a Lee Mavers, if you like, of the Lars, somebody who's who made such an impact on the music scene. And then you, you don't get very much output beyond the special AK and the magnificent Nelson Mandela, you know, and unlike, say, Terry Hall, that went through so many um, different bands, from Boy 3, Colourfield with Mushtak, and continued to make records and felt a presence for us. Mm. It's a shame, isn't it? Sad. How are they regarded in in where they came from? How are they regarded in Coventry? Uh, well, the, <laughs> there's a two tone village, you know. Um, a two tone village. Just, yeah, just just out, so just on the outskirts of the city centre. It's a little cobbled lane, and it's got a cafe, all two tone shops, a <laughs> venue, a museum <laughs> celebrating Coventry music. Two tone people are forever there, and it's a and they have events. And uh, Jerry was there last week DJing and playing to celebrate ten years of the of the village. I was there. The What's week- it called? The Two Tone Village. It's called Two Tone Village. Yeah. <laughs> That's absolutely. I never knew anything about that. <laughs> and I curated um guest curated an exhibition in Coventry in 2021, um, which uh, this post I don't know if you can see that the Herbert, and uh, that was huge the pe- people were traveling from all over the world to, to see all these artifacts from the era i mean and and you know the story that pauline black showed around uh charles and camilla or did she yeah so they came to see <laughs> i thought it was hilarious because it's got all of my records and scarves and the king of england has been <laughs> right. <it's> <laughs> collection. very good very good <laughs> is this around that museum we're talking about that, that's at the Herbert Museum, which is in the centre, and the, 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 t- the village is about a mile away. Incredible. <laughs> How do, do they have young fans? Are there young people who are interested in two-tone? 
Well, yeah, because, I mean, I've gone to see all these bands in the more recent years, and that's that's the surprising thing to me, really. Even when the specials have gone down from six original members down to three, and then two because Limbaugh can, can't really play the guitar, and the, the crowds don't really care in a way. And, you know, I'm sure we would, you know, we would be affronted if we went to see the Beatles and Paul McCartney went out as the Beatles and it was all session players, not their original fabs. You know, the idea that it, it's just a couple of specials on stage. And I was looking at the audience and there's, you know, they were playing massive theatres, two, three thousand, and the crowd didn't care and down the front. But isn't it so largely audience, about... It's largely about a sound and a look, isn't it? And therefore, only people kind of our age who remember the original lineup would care about those. But I, I can understand why it wouldn't matter so much now. Yeah, and that's it. So these you, you, younger generations who have come, as we know, younger generations don't have those kind of filters. And I don't, I hate this. I love this. I don't care for them. You know, and you fall into your things when we were kids. That does isn't a thing anymore, is it? That tri tribal differences, tribal factions. Nobody cares now. And I think younger generations of the 2000s just embrace music they like and they can see. And on top of that, I think there's lots of um, the uh, values within the music that are, are, are really attractive to people, not least if you go to see the selector, you're seeing a woman fronting an all uh, male band, or you go to see Rhoda performing songs of the Body Snatchers. These were women that were uh, really important at the time and are valued even with uh, even more so now for what they represented and that uh, and that of the vintage that they are they're still energetically kind of parading that stage and 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 still with strong attitudes and uh, messages to impart and I think that's you know influential hugely. I'm surprised that nobody's put together a, a package tour, a, a, a re reproduction of the, uh, of the 1979 yes. tour with three tribute <laughs> bands, Specials, Madness and Selector. I would have thought it would do really well because I saw that tour and it was one of the most extraordinary and fantastic and exciting things I've ever seen in my life. Yeah. Well, I think you described it in the smash hit as locomotive steam to... to it wasn't, is that the it was something like that. I can't remember now, but it's very nice of you to have dug it out. But no, I thought it was absolutely extraordinary. See yeah, those I mean, three bands on the same you bill. And, you and David wrote about to, to yeah. in Smash Hits. It was so exciting. You know, when I was that kid reading that, yes. and kind of kind of worked up by your words, but, and then seeing it on top of the pops, hearing it on the radio, absolutely desperate to be at the concerts in your living experience for me. And that's, that's what... Your job's journalism is when it's at its absolute best that you can kind of convey the excitement and the emotion and the thrill of what you've seen and pass it on to a young reader. But that was the thing. The thing about Two Town and that uh, the, at that time is it literally produced a story every week. Literally, there wow. was there would be a new single coming out, or yes. somebody was ill, or I don't know something had changed, or the somebody had the video, or the whatever. Romance. There was yeah. just all. Was something, and that was just two time. Yeah. Let alone anything else that was happening, you know, generating that amount of stories. Popular music has not been like that since, really. Not in terms of the sheer density of stories coming out of just one small country. Really, it wasn't particularly international at all. And, you know, and then one small little record label that's operating out of a top floor flat above a Doc Martin shop in Camden, yeah, so and, then, and then in Jerry's. A front room in his house in Coventry, and then the main man who has to make every single decision is doing what a pop star does. I'm in America. I'm in Europe. I'm in the studio. I'm being interviewed. When was he meant to make all those kind of decisions about approving artwork, signing no, new God. bands, doing all the things that the the manager or the record label does does? It I makes mean, extraordinary, that Jerry. You know, manage to pull off as many singles as you're suggesting, and the and and write the material that he did. And, and then go on to do Ghost Town. And I know you said that it's 18 months to turn. I mean, it's kind of, it is and it isn't because after Ghost Town in the summer of 1981, two years after Go Gangsters was first released, there is this second wave of two tone, which uh, is, is quite extraordinary in a way because you get the, the song after Ghost Town. And you imagine the, the biggest single in Britain whatever band that would be today, whether it's Adele or the Arctic Monkeys, and the next single that that 
person decides to do is a song about sexual assault and rape, The Boiler, and ending with the lead singer, Rhoda, screaming, screaming. for one minute of a song. Yeah, yeah. You can't listen to that record twice. Extraordinary. And then Nelson Mandela that follows that. Yeah. And, yeah. And the whole campaign that came around that. Songs like um, uh, uh, Racist Friend, which questioned who you knew, whether it was your brother, your sister, your lover, your mother, your father. You have to, you know, you have to relinquish these link, relinquish links, I don't know if you can do that. <laughs> um, but, you know, Jerry was challenging challenging you in his, in his lyricism to drop anybody that was racist in, in your phone book. And I remember I spoke to Tracy Thorne about this from everything but the girl. And she said, wow, well, my parents are racist. Where, what do I do? Because she was a big two-tone fan. And she said, I can't, you know, she said it's almost impossible. And I then went back to Jerry and said, I just spoke to Tracy. And he said he was flattered that she'd, you know, intellectually try to work it out. But he said it was more a challenge, a question, a, rather than a, a call for direct action. But it's incredibly powerful. And I, and by this point, when I'm maturing as a, as a young boy, that record and flipping over the seven inch single of Nelson Mandela, where the whole of the text is about the African National Congress and who Nelson Mandela was. I had no idea that this, who this organization was, who that was. And I would have been one of hundreds of thousands that received this didactic message. And as I say, said at the beginning, you know, I think Two-Tone gave me an education that school wasn't giving. And school definitely did not teach about apartheid in South Africa or more broadly, the atrocities that the British Empire were responsible for. And that's only beginning to seep into the national curriculum now. But artists, culture was doing that then. And I think that's quite incredible in, in this fickle world of pop music. So of all the of all the records that came out, the, all the two tone records, which which do you think was the was the greatest? <laughs> uh, uh, personally, for me, it would be the Too Much Too Young EP, which is five songs. It's an EP in the tradition of the Stones of the Beatles. Um, it's live. It's uh, Too Much Too Young, which is only two minutes long. Uh, because Terry Hall says too much too young as an introduction, giving it those extra three seconds. And then the B-side is a, is a medley uh, of uh, called the Skinhead Moonstomp of three mm. uh, scar, uh, early, uh, early uh, reggae classics. And it's filmed, at, uh, it was recorded at Tiffany's in Coventry at, right at the end of that 1979 two-tone tour. And... I, I just dived into that record wholesale as a child and just whacked at the volume as loud as possible, you know, or headphones on mm. at excruciating levels and just imagine being there. And I think that they somehow captured the absolute excitement of what that band was capable of doing on vinyl, which is a rare achievement. Yeah, an incredible, incredible record. And it, and it went to number one. And at, the, yes. at that moment, it was the, the the biggest leap that any record yes. had ever had. From and prob and properly and went to number one. That's the thing. Not manipulated to number one, properly to number one. Because yeah. if you sell records in those days, you sold records properly. <laughs> you know yeah, they I mean? were selling got up to half a million on a yeah. single. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, you know, it was the high point of the British singles market that one. Late yes, early yes, because I think I mentioned in the book that 1980, there's a bit of a, a, a lull and record sales begin to suffer. So those those subsequent hits in 1980, that uh, by all the bands, is, is a greater achievement in a way because sales are slumping. Yeah. And maybe that's why the Swinging Cats and the Body Snatchers and even the, the latter selector singles suffered greater. They hit, hit the lower regions and they, they maybe needed greater thrust uh, from promotion, or perhaps it was simply because Madness and the uh, and the specials were better songwriters. But also, there's a little vacuum just after punk, and it was kind of disco, and it was country, yeah, yeah, yeah. and it was kind of new wave, and there wasn't anything quite happening until 1991, electronic pop. And so there was that little window where where yeah. people were looking for something to happen, and there was this 
amazing movement with those things, incredible and the clothes the merchandise the look of it was so such a big part of it yeah i mean pauline black says, recalls that she went down oxford street and even evans the the the, the shop for uh, outsized clothing for larger women was selling black and white clothes you see this is the thing yeah. If the rag tray gets hold of you, that that means you're really happening. Yeah, you know, and that is clearly what happened. I think you and I were talking about this the other week. That you know that smash hits. Its early advertisers were all mail order advertisers. Yeah, and there were people selling, you know, pork pie hats, bum flaps, Walt Japsco badges, all that kind of stuff. To 12-year-old kids up and down the country just wanted to be able to buy one thing to put on their lapel or whatever and say, I'm this, I'm on this in this tribe, you know. Yeah, no, uh, I, I remember you saying that. And it's fascinating when you go back to the uh, especially the, all the music papers, and you when I went to the British Library and you go through the back pages and you suddenly see all these adverts. The, you uh, learn more yeah. about history, it particularly music papers from the small ads than you ever learn from the feature space. Small ads, the letters. The, the yeah. small ads and the letters tell you the truth. Yeah. Huh. You know, it's the prices people paid, what people really wanted, you know. Yeah, it was a uniform. Was, that's how David Hepworth does it. <laughs> well, <laughs> no, I think I think it's huge. I think it's really true, you know, and uh, it's, a, it's certainly more important than the editorials and so forth. Well, I might do. There, there was a thirst, wasn't there, in the late seventies, early eighties, for for embracing new fashions all the time, and the, this the the speed of change. I think it's a speed. Cool. It's a speed. It that thing that we, that we can't get our heads around. If you were if you were thirteen, fourteen years old, you wanted something to differentiate yourself from your elder brothers and sisters, who were two years oh. older. And that was really important. And that was that was such a perfect thing about two tone. You could just buy any number of these things that would give you, you could, your you own could uniform. Draw, you could draw it on your exercise book. Yeah, that was the thing about two tone. Yeah, people sat there with their exercise books, and they, you know, they just did little designs. They yeah, drew their own yeah. groups. You know, and I've just found my 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 design of the two tone cover that's going to be in an exhibition at the Barbican in January. It's like there it is. I did it as well. Oh, that's it, brilliant! It, it, thousands of people did it. It's yeah, brilliant. yeah, and at the same time, of course, then you had you know there'd just been a mod revival, hadn't there? And that that's a, yeah, yeah, you know, because yeah. of the Watch and because of the jam, and then and then you know i remember at the same time that i was getting into two tone in 1980 particularly at the same time you know as the infatuation with adam the ants which couldn't be yeah. any more yeah. to to what two tone looked like and then another really, merchandise option absolutely yeah and then you know you get these conversations you know pauline told me that when she went in to the chrysalis office to talk about after they left <coughs> Two tone in the summer of 1980. That you know, whereas before everybody was dressed in black and white pork pie hats, she went in. They've all got loom pants on, and they've got and they want to play the new Spandau Ballet record. And she said she couldn't believe just like that that there'd been a flip, and suddenly all this, all these bands were having to face the emergence of what will become new romantic music. And 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 I think it's kind of surprising that the that two tone begins continues to sell in that period so when dance craze is released in 1981 when it feels like the movement has perhaps passed that jumps into the charts at, in the album charts at number five sustains itself on the, for a number of weeks and has a, a theatrical release and i think at least 30 cinemas around the uk and so suddenly all the performances from early 80 and mid 80 of the when the bands were playing a, a more direct scar influence as opposed to the Muzak lounge influence that Jerry's now pushing it towards, fans go back in 81, back to where they were a year before and embrace it at the time where soft cells breaking through. It's kind of strange. Mm. Yeah, 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 people always want to go back. Well, <laughs> there it is. There's the story. It's a big, a big old thick beast, isn't it? So there's a, there's a lot of story in here. A surprising amount of story. Huge amount goes on. It's so yeah. nice that somebody's written it all down. I really enjoyed reading it. It's terrific. Yeah, yeah. Oh, it's brilliant. Thank you. I Thanks mean, so much, Daniel. Lovely to talk to you. 